All right. I've been very excited about this session. Thank you for coming, Ken. Of course. Thanks for having us. Uh, let's start with some numbers, um, because Lime has been growing so rapidly. Right. We I succeeded think, numbers. I think you are live in 130 cities right now. Correct. The last number you reported is 11.5 million rides. Now at 20 million rides. Now 20 million. Yeah. And you've raised $450 million in funding. 467, yes. OK, more or less. And it took you and around. 17 million takes you a long way, I'm just saying. It took you around, yeah, that's right. <laughs> it took you around 18 months. That's insane. Yeah. When did you realize that you had something very special and you thought, OK, we, we found something and it's going to become big? I mean, what's been amazing about this space is from day one, it's been a rocket ship. We launched our first product in what is June of 2017, and from that moment, we've been meeting the demand, and the product market fit has been amazing. And you are in charge of global expansion. Correct. Uh, we talked a bit about it backstage, but you must be on the road all the time. Uh, how do you make sure that you can travel everywhere, launch new cities, and keep the business on track? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot about the passion of really being and building local teams. And I believe in order to be a global business these days, you need to understand how to localize. And I love coming into places, meeting new team members, helping them see sort of what we can do in their cities, having a conversation with those city stakeholders. But yeah, I'm basically home three or four days a month right now, and I live on planes. Wow, three or four days a month. Yeah. Uh, and you think you can have meaningful conversations if you keep flying all around the world all the time? My job is to be able to bring in the team that uh -huh. is there always to make sure they can sort of have a long-term relationship and to bring some of the knowledge that we've had by being in those 130 plus markets. And our objective is to have a conversation where we're not only sharing data practically, but we're talking about how can we use that data for urban planning and really building into a larger vision of these smart cities. So hopefully I'm there as a catalyzer and then we have the long-term team that can really build the relationship for us to win succeed. So back in 2014, I was living in Shanghai and there were a ton of electric scooters mm -hmm. everywhere already. That was four years ago. Why do you think it took so long to see electric scooters in the US? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, even now, there's actually not shared systems of electric scooters that have disseminated throughout China. I think it's a kind of combination of maybe a perfect, st perfect storm of a number of factors. There's IoT, there's the ability to really scale out a system, there's the understanding on the fundraising side of this really is an opportunity to scale globally. So I think it's kind of been a place where now that we've seen sort of the first traction, on people understand the scalability of this, and you've sort of seen the growth from that. But in China, most people own their scooters. Mm. Uh, do you think the same thing is going to happen in the US? Let's say, for instance, that somebody is a very heavy Lime user. They spend hundreds of dollars per year on Lime. It's more or less the same thing as buying a scooter. Sure, but you also, when you have a scooter, if you think about maintenance, people stealing it, Sometimes you don't want a scooter when you go from your place to an office and an office back to somewhere else, but you have to bring it with you. So really what we're selling is not only just the actual trip, but the convenience of you living in truly empowered life and making the most of your urban environment. OK, so let's be serious now. Right. I'm sure you've seen the Bird Graveyard Instagram account mm. uh, showing a bunch of electric scooters scattered all over the streets of San Francisco. Why do you think people hate scooters so much? I mean, going back to the graveyard, it comes down to how do you create your scooters and what's your priority? So we focus day one on creating a vertically integrated supply chain, which means that our scooters have always been customized for the shared environment. When you're instead just buying scooters that are for personal mobility, slapping a sticker on them, yeah, they're not made for the wear and tear that you see every day. So we made sure we've always created the best, safest, and ultimately sort of long-lasting product we can. And then we have recycling programs so that we can always reuse parts. We actually melt down the metal, reuse that as well. So we've really invested in creating a life cycle with our product. It's part of why we have our Lime Green initiative, for instance. Here in Berlin, we actually pick up and sort of do a number of things with green methodologies, have e-bikes that are, have trailers that are going around and collecting these things. So we really try and look at the entire life cycle and try and make ourselves as green as possible. But you say the best and safest scooters? Yeah, we just put a version 3.0 out, uh, which is the most durable. It's actually customized for the space, deals with any of the other issues that many of the other providers have had. And we were even transparent about saying, look, when there were some issues about other providers, we came out and we gave a notice of, we told all of our sort of users, we collected all of the scooters, we actually created an algorithm on top of what the other manufacturers had created to further justify and figure out what was the issue, and we only put out those that passed that algorithm, and then we even changed the way that we even were charging some of those. Yeah, for those in the room not following, you had to recall some scooters. Yeah, I mean, uh, the industry did how it many, How many scooters did you have to recall? I don't have a number for you, unfortunately. Is it more like 10, 1,000? 
I mean, it's 10,000. For us, we brought most of our scooters back in to do testing, right? So it's more a question of how many were put back out, and it was definitely something that we put out many of our scooters afterwards because they did meet the testing. Do you plan to use technology to make sure that people park their scooters, um, you know, on the on the sidewalk, when they're not blocking the way? that they're using the scooters properly? No, it's a, a great note. I mean, ultimately, the space is so nascent that the technology is just catching up to the potential of the product market fit. And I think one of the reasons that you're going to see this space continue to get more and more potent over time is that the ability to use technology around 3D imaging and other things to really figure out sidewalk detection are all just the beginning of a space that should really transform the way that cities can see this as working hand in hand to continually improve the system. So you're saying GPS is too limited for what you want to do with your scooters? I mean, GPS is great. Obviously, it's been the beginning and enabled us to do lots in this space, but there's so much room for improvement. OK, let's switch gear a bit and talk about startups sort of this space, uh, biking startups, and especially the Chinese giants. Uh, I'm sure you've seen that OFO had some scaling issues, and they had to scale back. Putting it lightly, but yes. Especially in international cities, and, and they had to, you know, pause for a minute and say, maybe we shouldn't launch so many cities at once. Um, what are you learning from that? I, mean, I think it's about the approach. From day one, we talk to cities. We figure out how to go from pilots and really scale into a city. We don't necessarily just place bikes there and hope for the best. I think also having a multimodal fleet means you can customize what's needed for different environments. And sometimes a regular pedal bike is not what you need. And so allowing us to create a customized program, scaling it over time, really using data, having data actually be something where we talk to the city, hey, we were seeing this amount of usage on our vehicles. Therefore, we want to continue to scale up the vehicles. So even after raising $457 million, you're not thinking, OK, let's buy 10 million scooters and bikes and put them all on the road at once? I mean, again, our methodology is working side by side with cities. And the ability to do so is based on showing demand. And one of the interesting things is that what you're seeing now is that cities have long wanted to support alternative mobility lanes and really creating the urban infrastructure. But it's been a bit of a chicken and egg problem. They haven't been able to show the demand because there wasn't the supply. But we provide the supply, the demand is there, and I think what you'll see is that as we create more infrastructure and we encourage more of this behavior, cities will encourage also to see more and more of these types of companies being able to really serve their, their citizens. I find it interesting that in China, a lot of um, bike startups took off and there are multiple scooter startups in the US. Why do you think there is this sort of cultural difference between China and the US? It's interesting. I mean, I think, first and foremost, bike culture never has left China, right? The US is trying to figure out what is its new culture of mobility. We're trying to figure out how to go beyond the car. And I think the reality is that sort of the e-bike and the electric scooter and now our electric car, which are going into, really creates a first version of that transformation in a way that a Western audiences can understand and feel comfortable and really meets their needs. A couple of weeks ago, there was an article in the New York Times uh, saying that Facebook hired a PR firm called Definers. It's an opposition research firm, and they attacked George Soros using anti-Semitic right. comments. Yeah. First off, we do not support that. We do not believe that this is a space that should be used for anything but enabling and empowering. We use them to work on our lime green and our carbon free programs. As soon as we understood they were doing some of these things, we went to parted ways and finished our program with them. So now you admit that you're working with, with definers. Yeah, we did work with them, but we're ultimately not working with them. OK, because when we reached out, you, you wouldn't comment on, on the issue a couple of weeks ago. But why, why did you hire them knowing that they would send uh, sort of nasty pitches to journalists. Again, we didn't know that, A, and we were using them to research our carbon-free program, understanding what were the leverages of opportunity for us to really create the messaging, and also to do our own research, understanding the life cycle, all the pieces that are in a very complex business. As soon as we found out there were the practices that were not beneficial and ultimately not creating a good image for either companies in the industry, but they were also recommended by top providers all the way around, and as soon as we learned differently, we decided to move on. Let's take a very specific example. Sure. We at TechCrunch searched uh, through our inboxes mm. and we found an email from Definers attacking Bird, mm. the competitor. We wrote something on Bird and it was a sort of um, chirpy email saying, hey, FYI, uh, you wrote about Bird, but I think the numbers are not as big as you reported in your article. This isn't about going to a car-free society. 
Sure. It's about I trashing will say I don't know anything about that, honestly. I mean, from my purview, the way we've engaged them and what we've done is part of why when I hear things, this is why we don't work with them. So you weren't aware of this email and this kind of campaign? No. Aren't you supposed to know who you're working with? Yeah, of course we know who we're working with as to knowing exactly the tactics. I don't know your tactics at TechCrunch and I'm here talking to you. Now, knowing all of this now, do you plan to keep working with definers in the future? Uh, we're not working with them. Okay, so you stopped the relationship altogether. All right, let's switch gear and talk about... Um, you like switching gears. Are we up-leveling, are we down-leveling, which way are we going? Well, you don't have any gear on the scooter, though. That's what I was like, say. I don't even know anymore. Yeah. Let's talk about global expansion. Uh, you live in, in Berlin, obviously, with bikes and scooters. Yeah, electric bikes here. Uh, Frankfurt, Paris, Brussels, Madrid, all around Europe, basically. Uh, what has been the reaction so far in Europe right here? I mean, numbers again speak. Ultimately, we've seen some of the best markets between Paris and Madrid, and people understand this is solving a key issue. In many ways, the infrastructure needs of Europe are even more defined because there's beautiful old cities that are trying to deal with these congestion issues. Here, obviously, in Germany, we're trying to get rid of diesel cars. These are things that we ultimately want to work hand in hand, and I think the European cities are very progressive in their view and ability to create a new future for that. And when it comes to numbers, do you think you can get higher numbers in Europe, or do you still see higher numbers in the U.S.? Again, it's so market to market, it's hard to like do an apples to apples comparison. But I do believe that Europe will be one of the sort of largest opportunities for alternative mobility vehicles, and it'll probably lead the way to the transformation around the world. And what about Berlin, more specifically, because we're in, Ber we're in Berlin right now? Yeah, so meaning we are here, we have electric bikes, our fleet Good is... numbers in Berlin? Yes, strong. I mean, again, the, the culture here understands it. There's also the infrastructure for it. There's protected lanes. Protected lanes are a massive part of creating safety, of enabling people to really feel like they can adopt a system like this. And it's one of the reasons we wanted to find cities that sort of can create that and allow for us to put that forth to other cities as well. And you're still rolling out new cities, sometimes with bikes, sometimes with scooters, sometimes both. Uh, the company was first called Lime Bike. Uh, what's the breakdown right now between bikes and scooters? Yeah, so from day one, we always wanted to be multimodal. We actually went with Lime Bike because it was SEO, and honestly, because cities understood the bike world and were sort of more open to that. And because we've always been collaborative from day one, we wanted to sort of start with programs that would allow us to increase and sort of diversify over time. In terms of the breakdown, I don't have a breakdown I can share, but ultimately we are seeing every market is different. Depends on topography, depends on sort of what the use cases are, and that changes therefore the type of fleet that we deploy. So you're not going to prioritize um, scooters over bikes, for instance? I mean, again, electric bikes are for longer distances, for hills, depends on what you're trying to do. So we see having different vehicles actually enabling people to say, I need to get around my city, I don't think if I need a scooter or this, I think about what's the best vehicle, and hopefully we can always be the solution for you. Let's talk about um, one of your favorite partners, Uber. Hmm. Uh, they invested in Lime back in May or June of last year, of this year. And now users can unlock scooters from the Uber app, at least in some cities. Yep. Uh, how is the relationship with Uber right now? I mean, we're obviously independent. They're a minor investor in us. I believe they saw us as having built a strong city-first collaborative relationship, and that's one of the things we're trying to do is they really build into a mobility as a service platform they can offer cities globally. So would you call them an investor, a partner, or both? I mean, they're obviously both, right? We are working with them in terms of enabling us to be found in certain cities, and they are a minor investor, but obviously we have our own trajectories, we operate as separate companies, Ultimately, we're sort of creating a future which is electric and sort of clearly focused on that. And we believe that in some cases, rideshare hasn't really created the transformation of less vehicles on the road. And we needed to create a new future to get rid of those. And what do you think about the current strategy of uh, moving away from just cars and ride hailing to become a sort of um, app for all sorts of transportation? Yeah, I mean, I think the reality is that we want to see cities transform, and we welcome anyone who wants to find a way to help us do that alongside of us. That's part of why we're more of a partner-based company, really about long-term relationships and collaborating, than we are about trying to create enemies between people. So does it mean if Lyft or maybe a local competitor like My Taxi, if they approach you I mean, and they say, the we want, yeah, we want to, to have Lime scooters in the app, you would do it? Always open to the conversation. And Uber also acquired uh, Jump and they're going to roll out uh, sort of Uber bikes and scooters in some cities. Do you think it's a threat for you? 
No, again, we welcome it. Ultimately, this is proving the viability of the space, enabling the transformation we need to see. The fact that globally we have less than 5 to 10 percent what is alternative mobility in terms of the number of trips that are happening and commuting and getting around the city every day, that's the real thing we need to do. We need to address and really change the behavior. And if multiple companies are enabling that, then we're all for it. And the fact that you partnered with Uber, isn't, isn't it a way to see if it's working and to acquire you down the road maybe next year or something like that? I, mean, I think Uber has its own sort of competencies it needs to continue to develop. I think them playing with us is ultimately saying they've acknowledged our competencies, that we have built an amazing platform, fast execution, scale globally, faster than anyone else has, and it's our ability to sort of leverage both sides of the partnership to really go back to cities and say, we can offer a full range of different ways for you to really change the way people get around in your city. All right, let's talk about the business model now. Much um, gears? I guess we can't, so there we go. just going to another topic. Uh, so the business model, uh, as, as you know, some companies have um, bought a ton of bikes like Ofo and Mobike, and even now it doesn't seem like they found a, a, like a business model that actually works. Would you say that Lime's business model right now works? I mean, we have markets where we've already proven ourselves to be margin positive. So we know the business works. Ultimately, it's about behavior change. Mm. The more we see people using and sort of creating the opportunity to really integrate into their lives, the more successful the program is. Do you track the number of rides per day per scooter? Yeah, of course. I mean, one of the benefits of sort of the clarity of what we have on the vehicle set is we're always optimizing what are hotspot locations, where they should they be best put, with how do we optimize for the time of day, seasonality, all the other aspects of that. And in a busy city, like how many times a day somebody is going, I mean, how many times a day people are going to ride the one scooter in particular? It can range. Unfortunately, I can't give you an exact number, but let's just say it's actually multiples more than we actually see regular bikes. Oh, okay, because that's shorter rides? Honestly, I think it's shorter rides. I think it's also the fact that you can be in the suit, and if it's a hot day or whatever else, like there's an ability for you to use a vehicle that's electric in a way that you couldn't otherwise. I think there's a little bit of the novelty, there's a sense of like electric and the innovation behind it. I think there's a lot of contributing factors that mean that you see people adopt and sort of feel more loyal to electric vehicles than they would otherwise. And when it comes to maintaining the, the fleet of vehicles, uh, you have to work with people uh, so that they, they will charge the scooters overnight, for instance. Mm. How does it affect the bottom line? Do you think uh, you can find enough people willing to do that and still be positive as a whole? Completely. I mean, ultimately, our juicers, which is the third party charging system that we've created, yeah. enables us to offer complementary and supplemental income in a way that is a win win situation. And we've been able to use that effectively to scale up, really create local evangelists, understand they help us actually report issues so we collect our vehicles faster so that we have the best and safest quality out there. So we've seen it as a win-win and it's something that people are seeing the value and because it's supplemental, it's not a full-time job. They can do it at night or in the evening and make an extra money. That is sort of as a win-win for us to really build a partnership that we think will continue to grow over the years. And let's say you grow 10x. Can it scale as well? Can you find enough We've done it places already. to put all the scooters everywhere? Yeah, I mean, we have cities where Seattle, for instance, we started with what is less than 1,000 vehicles. We're now at almost eight to 10,000 vehicles. We know we can do this. It's something that we've proven and it's part of what cities believe us as one of the best and world-class operators. So one of your competitors, uh, Bird, announced a sort of new model, uh, which is letting people acquire a fleet of scooters and then being um, sort of rental company for, for scooters. What do you think about this model? I think everyone's trying to find unique and interesting ways to address the space. Mm. And I think the reality is it's probably an interim solution until the sort of cities have allowed for the saturation. And really that comes back to it, is that this space and really the transformation is not about having a couple of hundred vehicles in a market. You need to see sort of an actual couple of thousand in these cities for it to really be ubiquitous, something that you can always find and trust upon. And I think finding different ways to create that is something that we're all looking for so that you really feel that there's always one accessible. Okay, we have time for another question. Um, where, where are you traveling next after Berlin? Whew, I actually get to go back to Seattle. We have a Leeds retreat. Back to uh, Seattle. But then from there, I'll go to, let's see, Sao Paulo to check in. Uh, I will go to Santiago, Chile, where we just launched. I will check in on the APAC markets in Sydney and in Singapore. So yeah, keeping busy.
And for instance, when you come to Berlin, do you actually use Lime to go from one meeting to another? Yeah, I mean, it happens outside of my hotel. There were actually two parked there. I didn't tell them to do that. And I managed to grab it to go to first, my first meeting, which I had before this. And it's interesting to see, like, you get a read of kind of how people are ultimately adopting them. I love asking people questions. I love testing all our vehicles. My operations team always knows when I'm in town because I'm like, hey, there's an issue here. Hey, there's an issue here. Hey, good, good job. This should be placed over there. So I'm always trying to sort of add intelligence at the same time as use our product. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.